Hello and welcome to Games with Garfield. I'm your host, Jessica Price, and we have a very special guest in addition to our two regulars, Scaff Elias. Hello. And Richard Garfield. Hi. Our guest is Steve Jackson, who you may know from creating the GURPS role-playing system, Munchkin, and a bunch of other games. Guilty. So, Steve, which of your games is your favorite? Do you have children? No. <laughs> <laughs> then which is your favorite isn't a good rejoinder. So. <laughs> I have a single oh. kitten. So I'll have to fall back on the truth, which is that the one that I'm working on now is my favorite. Always. Good answer. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into doing games, you know, just sort of your early history. I answered a classified ad, and it turned out to be for what was then known as Metagaming Concepts, looking for an editor for the Space Gamer magazine. Well, I'm so glad to hear that you can go great places from being an editor. I didn't get the job. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, scratch that. And you already knew you could go great places from not being an editor. Indeed. Right. I'm uh, right. doomed to continue. I was overqualified. Nice. He hadn't expected anybody to knew anything about games to respond. Wow. Um, so I got a gig uh, doing game development on a contract basis. And that was on Ken St. Andre's Monsters, Monsters. And one thing led to another. <laughs> so that was your first paying gig in the uh, games industry? Yes, I had... Uh, yeah, let's, let's just leave it as that. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that I had done anything before that that got paid, and if I did, it was There trivial. was the life drawing for games class, but we're not going to talk yeah, about right. that. Now, before that, what got you interested in games? Were you always a gamer, or was there a seminal game? Well, I don't think that I spent a lot of time playing games before high school. In high school, I played a great deal of chess badly with the other geeks in what we call the math office mafia. <laughs> um, I was not all that great a chess player, but I always wanted to mess with it, and I came up with a four-handed chess game, which I years and years later found out just absolutely reprised other four-handed chess games that had been done. <laughs> um, so why do you think GURPS never became... Well, I guess before we go there, can you tell our listeners briefly what GURPS is? Okay, it is a role-playing system. Uh, the initials stand for Generic Universal Role-Playing System. That was intended to be a placeholder title, but it's stuck for years and years while the game was under development, and in the end, we found out that literally every synonym for fantasy, adventure, dragon, dungeon, and magic had been used in every possible combination of less than four. <laughs> nice. Richard can probably tell us how many that is, but you know it's a whole bunch. Um, and by then, we had forgotten how stupid GURP sounded. We were all used to it, so we inflicted it on the actual released game. It was a significant acronym. Um, generic and universal taken together were just a way of saying, okay, this is a rule set that instead of focusing on one genre will try to make it possible to reproduce any sort of genre and indeed to combine them in any damn fool way you might come up with. It, it was intended to facilitate cross-genre gaming and artistically was a, a moderate success. Uh, I feel now looking back that it's frightening to the newcomer because it has such a stack of books, but in the beginning it didn't have a stack of books. We were so impressed with ourselves when we got the third world book out. <laughs> well, look at that. There are three different <laughs> books for GURPS now. Don't we rock? Uh, then at, eventually it filled a six-foot shelf. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So my question was, why do you think it never became quite the household name that D&D &D did? Because everybody I know that's a serious role-playing gamer is familiar with it, but it just didn't seem to, you know, everybody I know that's not a serious role-playing gamer is familiar with Dungeons Pro & Dragons. Probably isn't. Well, really Dungeons & Dragons had a serious, serious first mover advantage. It was the first RPG. Although we all probably have our favorite editions of D&D &D or favorite horror stories about things that have been done to the game and the game worlds over the years. <laughs> cough, Morley the Wizard, cough. <laughs> Insert terrifying visual. Um, 
The fact is that no one who had control of the Dungeons and Dragons game ever completely ruined it. Ah. <laughs> Sounds like there's a story there that you should perhaps... Oh, there are dozens of stories, and I'm really not thinking of any particular one. Just if you go back and think about pioneering products in all kinds of fields, you'll come up with things that were really, really good and groundbreaking, and then somebody messed up and they went away and something else overtook them. When was the last time you used Lotus 123? There we go. At the same time, D&D is not the household name now that World of Warcraft is. That is true. So the folks running D&D at any particular time, although they did a great job of maintaining and developing the property within Dead Tree Gaming, booted various opportunities to take it digital and... Somebody else came out of nowhere, but if you look back, they came out of nowhere very, very slowly, but it was still plenty fast enough to establish a quality property that is as much of a revised, simplified, pared down look at the world of D&D as D&D itself was a pared down, combined, regurgitated, mashed together Lord of the Rings and uh, Fritz Lieber and Conan the Barbarian and so on and so on. I mean, uh, so, so World of Warcraft is a pastiche of a pastiche, and it's hugely, hugely successful. <laughs> it's good. It's shiny. It's gripping. People it's like shiny. it. Um, do you think that the generic and universal aspects of GURPS hurt at all? They didn't hurt it, but... Okay, this is a complicated answer, and if I contradict myself, just just remember I'm not running for office. (laughs) Um, Generic and Universal was new when the project started and was still pretty shiny when it actually came out. So so that, that was what was cool about it. So no, that didn't hurt it, but what did hurt it was was the, the evil flip side of being generic and universal, which was that there was no one specific story background to associate with it. If you were into GURPS, you were into it because of game mechanics or because of fanatic loyalty to your own story that could only be told well through a system that open. But you weren't writing fanfic about Dristord. And- Bingo! Bingo, exactly. If you were writing fanfic, it was about your world, and GURPS was made to fade into the background, but whoop, there it is in the background. See it right there? No, actually you don't, do you? And if you were seriously, seriously loyal to the idea of cross-genre mechanics, Fine, you were a rules geek and you talked to other rules geeks, and as you pointed out, the rules geeks and the serious gamers all do know about GURPS, but it's not going to break out when it's all about mechanics. It was a game for gamers. Mm-hmm. And you take something like World of Warcraft, and that is, that is almost not a game for gamers. World of Warcraft was almost mass market from the start, and it got such penetration that now people who wouldn't identify themselves as gamers, if you hold them over a slow fire and make them tell the truth, they'll say, oh, well, except for wow, yeah. <laughs> you know, and maybe Farmville, and so on and so on. Okay, you're a gamer. <laughs> you're a gamer. You're never going to admit it, but we got you. I have friends who uh, got into World of Warcraft because they like the art style. Of all things. Yeah. Uh, 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 don't say of all things. WoW is beautiful. It it's is. heavily derivative of somebody else who didn't move fast enough. Yes. Which is... Uh, you know, but it our, is beautiful. Right, yes. But, you know, our, our friends at Games Workshop tell beautiful stories and created a beautiful background. And, and, and once again, you know, they, they did not move quickly enough into digital. And fine, you know, there was the niche for... World of Warcraft, and it fills it very well. <laughs> so do you play any RPGs? I still get to roleplay Once in a Blue Moon. Uh, what do you play? Uh, either What's Going On at a Convention, which is usually Freeform, or Little GURPS, but really not very often anymore because most of the time I'm, I'm 
mocking role playing with, with Munchkin. <laughs> and that that's right, that's leads right. smoothly into what I was going to ask. It about was next. smooth, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, but, uh, but you know the old saying, I mock because I love? Well, no, I mock because I'm a mocker, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, what made you decide I want to do a game mocking D anD D? Well, I love parody. I love satire. Mocking is such an honest, nasty word, but teasing, making fun, whatever you want to call it, you know, just I love parody and satire. And it wasn't, you know, what made me decide to do a game because the voices in my head were off that month, and nobody <laughs> made me. I truly don't remember. Just someplace along the line, it was, hey, you know, it would be fun to do a silly game about a dungeon crawl. And then, hey, okay, it would be fun to put in pointed and not so pointed references to the way role playing is developed. Like, it's really not fair, even to bad me, to say it's a mockery of D&D. It's a mockery of bad D&D. It's a mockery of the kind of D&D of, you know, my first D&D experience. So. Every, everyone's first D&D experience. Right. Well, my first D&D experience, basically, uh, all the players were sock puppets that the DM used to kill bandits in outdoor adventures and take their stuff. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be like, okay, you found some bandits. Okay, we found some bandits. What now? now you should cast Cloud Kill. How do we cast Cloud Kill? You say, I cast cloud kill. Okay, I cast cloud kill. Okay, sound effect. You killed all the bandits. Let's see what you found. Sound effect. Oh, cool. You found blah, 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 blah. Okay, what do we do now? You take it. (laughs) At this point, I'm curious to find out what made you uh, keep playing RPGs, let alone end up making them if that oh, was your I first quit. experience. It was years later when I picked up another <laughs> <Okay>. one. <laughs> and and, and then, then it was Traveler at a different school. So when you did Munchkin, did you have a sense of like how a game of Munchkin should play out or did you sort of... I played it once and you know, maybe, it was people I was, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was a group of people I was playing in, but it, it was fun and it was definitely funny. It had a meandering feel to it, though. It wasn't... Oh, that's, uh, it's, it's a game about killing monsters and taking their stuff, and you can play it very ironically. But the reason it succeeds is not because people play it ironically. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, the, it succeeds because it is fun to kill monsters and take their stuff and level up and keep your friends from leveling up. That's very important. Yeah. Blizzard based uh, you know, World of Warcraft on that central concept, and they seem to have done all right with it. Yeah, certainly it always surprises me how, how broad Munchkin is. I see it in uh, kids' houses where the kids are obviously too young to be playing D&D, and they still enjoy the game a lot, so they're not getting the mockery. They're, they're enjoying these... these no, them young. no, it's graduated, it's long graduated from satire of D&D and just gone over to random silliness. <laughs> <laughs> Which is indeed the most any game, I think, can... Hope for. If you're getting random silliness, you've done something right. Random silliness, yeah. And of course, it does have one big advantage over World of Warcraft, which is that, that, you know, all they have for art is large studios full of dedicated, highly trained people with millions of dollars worth of equipment. They're they're stuck with that, and we got John (laughs) Kovalik. The the art was one of my favorite things. So when I was reading your Wikipedia entry in uh, desperate preparation for this podcast that I did not know was going to happen tonight. I didn't either. That Wikipedia entry would have been different. (laughs) (laughs) It would have had more in it about my Nobel Prizes. (laughs) It uh, had a paragraph about microgaming. Okay, well, I honestly don't know what's in the Wikipedia entry, so so this will have to be a very leading question. Okay, well... Okay. Um, microgaming. Microgaming, which Wikipedia described as the sort of gaming when you bring the necessary materials to your friend's house, you can fit them in a Ziploc bag. Okay. Oh. So do you know anything about so this? Or are they totally metagaming? making it up? Microgame was a trademark of metagaming for little games in a Ziploc bag, and the idea behind those was that the footprint was just the same as a paperback book. The theory was that then bookstores would rack them in their paperback book racks. That didn't work, but the format became popular anyway because 
in my opinion, because it was big enough to fit in your back pocket and you could take it to school and play on the lunch hour, which was where an awful lot of gamers were at the time. They were in high school and a lot of the older ones were in the service and it would certainly fit in the back fatigue pocket. As Ogre was the first game of yours that I played at during a school lunch hour. So, <laughs> Well, that was my first game. So yeah, that, that was my first independent design. But anyway, I don't think micro gaming is an accepted term any place, but maybe it is now because it's been in Wikipedia. Well, I've actually, I've heard it applied to the sort of RPGs where the rules uh, fit on one sheet of paper? Well, if people want to use the word, it's okay with me. It's just <laughs> Is that official? It's just, just I have, uh, I have sitting on the table here a game that fits in a it's plastic indeed. Ziploc bag. A tiny but, Ziploc. But it had never occurred to me that, that playing this was micro-gaming. <laughs> I was curious as to, like, were they board games? Were they What sort of games were they? Those were board games. The board was a folded piece of slightly heavier than typing stock paper. Okay, visual, uh, Richard digging around on game shelves, the hugeness of which I cannot describe. <laughs> so, so someplace in the huge, huge labyrinth of game shelves, Richard has pulled out Old, old ogre. So is this a micro game? Am I looking at a micro game? Yes. Let's see if it actually says yes. Reading from the back cover. This is the first in a new series, micro games. Small in format, but big in play value. Micro games are for the person who enjoys games, but doesn't want to spend a lot of money or spend all day playing. Take that, Wikipedia. All right. It, it really says that. And the price was? Two ninety five. Yeah. That's not a lot. Yeah. They're so cute and cheap. <laughs> <laughs> like me. <laughs> okay, yes, and uh, because we have no visuals, things that you can't see include the game map. You're so nice, Steve. I always tell the audience, if you look up at your screen, just to frustrate them. <laughs> right. No. <laughs> no, that's right. This, this game map is in black and white. It has hexes that are really too small, even for the little teeny counters that came with the game. Is this, in fact, an original map? It may very well be. My, we've gotten better since then. Um, it oh, has no. it has two kinds of hexes: the clear ones, which are white, and the obstructed ones, which are black. Maybe it wasn't until the second edition that I actually drew in the craters, but I remember there was an edition that had drawn in craters, but they didn't look very good because on the graphics budget metagaming had at the time, I was drawing the craters. Was the graphics budget also two ninety five? No, no, no. T turning in a, a reproducible map uh, would have been, you know, part of my deliverable as designer. Ah. Yes, and it, right, this is first printing because page nine is almost completely illegible because I knew nothing about screens and <laughs> a piece of art with a whole lot of black in it is screened very heavily over page nine. So you would have to just sort of figure it out a word at a time. So we are now sitting at a table filled with what looks like paperback books that, you know, came out of some box from the 70s. So all these could be played in how long, would you say? Uh, oh, you could easily finish a game of Ogre in a half hour. That was one reason it got such good playtesting. Is, is we were enjoying working on it, and it finished quickly. <laughs> wow. And, yeah, they would indeed fit in your back pocket. Uh, so how many of these uh, micro games did you do? I don't recall exactly several. Um, Ogre... Melee and Wizard, of course. GEV. What else is in the stack? That'll that'll Death be touch. There's Invasion of the Air Eaters. Yeah, that one was not mine. That was, oh. <laughs> no, it was a good game. These are uh, almost like the equivalent of Flash games today. Uh, you know, things like well, when we would go to the store, we wouldn't have much money, and you know, would buy these little things. And um, you know, D and we were playing a lot of D and D, but uh, or chess for a. A big game, but these things you could just, for a, for a small amount of money, go in and uh, enjoy a, a new kind of cool gaming experience. Of course, this was released in 1977, um, which uh, at 2.95. So in today's dollars, you know that's uh, that's what what would that be in today's dollars? 700, 800, something <laughs> like that. 
one of the last things that I released is selling for four ninety nine. So nice. it's still possible to do a cheap <laughs> game. And, and what was that? What was that? Oh, that's the Cthulhu dice game here, which I'm not supposed to bang on the table, but it comes with glass beads, Harem Rattle. <laughs> They're very pretty and green. Oh, they're shiny. They are. And the die. It's very important to have shiny. So this game is a follow-up to another dice game you've got, Zombie Dice? Not really a follow-up. They were developed in parallel. Oh, okay. And, yes, Zombie Dice is an additive game rather than subtractive. Uh, Okay, uh, game speak babble. Subtractive is where you start with a score and work down from it, like magic, for instance. Or, in this case, we're going down from three, which makes it a much faster game. (laughs) (laughs) Just almost instant, in fact. And in Zombie Dice, you are zombies. You're trying to eat brains. Tasty, tasty brains. Except you moan and wave your hand and and role play it. See, I really didn't realize uh, when I first threw zombie dice on the table for the guys to work on that I had created a role playing game. But it, (laughs) but it, it it is, or more to the point, a a storytelling game. The dice represent the victims fleeing from the awful zombies. Each one can come up brains, which means you got him, or shotgun, which means they shot you, or running feet. And the running feet mean that if you choose to take another turn, you will have to roll that die again. Dice also come in three colors. Green are easy victims with three brains and only one shotgun. Red are hard victims with three shotgun sides and only one brain. But a tasty brain. It's it's a tasty brain. (laughs) You're happy when you get a red brain. And the yellow dice are two of each. And yes, we deliberately coded those like stop sign colors because at least North America, every, everybody's stop signs are the same. And, and you know, green means go and red means danger. And it's a push your luck game. The basic <laughs> mechanic is get as many brains as you can, but don't get three shotguns because if you get three shotguns, you drop all the tasty brains that you've accumulated in your cold, undead hands. But what happened is that people start telling stories. If you pull out three green dice, you say, ha ha, Girl Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And if you, 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 you get a red runner, you say, oh, okay, the state trooper didn't want to face me, but he might turn around. <laughs> and if you pull three red dice out of the cup, you say, oh, no. Arnold, Bruce, and Woody, <laughs> I'm dead. <laughs> like most push-your-luck games, an important part of the game is taunting someone who really should stop rolling (laughs) to explain to him that, no, he doesn't want to quit yet. So what you're saying is, this is a good game in which to get your companions drunk. (laughs) All sound like excellent drinking games. Well, in fact, we have theorized about the drinking game versions of both these. We've never actually done anything. And uh, we've, we've seriously discussed marketing a set of toothpick holders with little red, yellow, and green uh, brains on them. And because, you know, all gamers need toothpick holders, but the, the most efficient way to manufacture toothpick holders is to go to a shot glass factory. Seems like it should work. Indeed. The uh, mechanics for the zombie game are actually uh, pretty fresh. I mean, it's very simple, but uh, the fact that you're rolling different colored dice makes it so that every turn, it doesn't, uh, most Press Your Luck games I've played have been roll a fixed set of dice, and it's much more static. In this one, uh, you pull three dice out of this cup, and sometimes it's an easy pull, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you'll, you'll keep going because you've got uh, the red brains on the table, and so and so that makes the the cup a lot safer. Yes. Sometimes when I play it with people, they say, "Aha, that's Farkle," and I'm going, "I can beat you. You haven't figured out about the colors yet." <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's got some uh, really nice uh, differences. At the same time, if you have played games like uh, Farkle or what are other other names for that basic, because uh, that's six man that's been around for about. Or, uh, Cosmic, Cosmic Wimp Out. Wimp out yeah. There we go. If you've played those, you know half of what goes into this. But that doesn't make it much easier to learn because it's easier to learn anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tiny bit more demanding than Cthulhu Dice of the, of the two of them. Cthulhu Dice is quicker and much less deep. But uh, they're both b- good bar games. Uh, the only problem with them as a bar game is that the dice bounce off the bar. Mm. I-, I can't do anything about that. We need, to- <laughs> we need to work on better bars. 
So these were the most recent games that you've released? Unless I'm just completely going blank on something, those are the most recent complete games. We're continuing to come out with Munchkin supplements, Mm -hmm. and and more stuff is in the works. And uh, can you tell us anything about uh, the stuff that's in the works, a genre maybe, or uh, a time to look forward to it, a release date, anything? Well, we have announced announced, uh, the next core game for Munchkin, which is Munchkin Zombies, (laughs) because everybody loves zombies at the moment, and it was a whole lot of fun to write the the zombie game. Everything's better with zombies. Everything is better with zombies, and monkeys, and bacon. Yes. (laughs) So I have an idea for a recipe. (laughs) So the next Munchkin is going to come with a cookbook. The next Munchkin going to come with a cookbook. (laughs) Okay, okay, my brain is seriously damaged because I'm thinking of cards. (laughs) Okay, the next Munchkin does in fact have a recipe in it. That's that's, excellent. That's why I'm going, you know, is she she reading my mind? And if so, (laughs) stop now. Uh, But I'm not going to tell you what the recipe is because that would kill the joke and because if you home viewers really think about it you'll figure it out we are working on several other dice games but the lightning hasn't really struck on any of them yet Uh, none of them has graduated from rolling around i mean we're rolling dice on the table but we're not yet rolling dice on the table and laughing madly (laughs) Uh, until we get to the laughing madly part you won't see those uh, so, do you guys have any final questions? Uh, j- just uh, what what sort of games are you are you playing now or recently um, that that aren't yours under development? What what are you what are you enjoying <laughs> right now? Okay, well, let's see. The last computer game that wasn't mine that I played was Age of Empires three. The last board game that I played that wasn't mine it might have been Can't Stop. Mm-hmm. Like that game. Can't Stop is excellent. Push your luck. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I can't recall the last dice game that I played that wasn't mine, but the last almost dice game that I played that wasn't mine is Laboom. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. And uh, Laboom has dice, but I don't, I, I don't acknowledge it as a game because you make no decisions in Laboom, but it's a cool pastime and it was the direct inspiration for for Cthulhu and Zombie Dice. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I I played it and it was like this is cool. It's too bad it's not a game. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had this discussion with the guys at Mayfair and they're actually on the same wavelength and I understand you can anticipate some dice games from them that are dice games mm-hmm. but that will still be that fast playing and, and really Laboom does set a bar it, if it can't finish that fast and be that much fun then don't do it if your goal is a simple dice game uh-huh. have you uh, played any uh, hidden role games like the uh, like werewolf uh, yes uh, I've noticed a lot more of those sort of uh, people taking stabs at design in that area I actually haven't noticed a lot more of what I've seen as a whole lot more editions of Are You a Werewolf with werewolf crossed out and, and some other word written in. I've seen in. a bunch of those. Uh, Covert Action was one. Okay, uh, I haven't and, uh, seen that's, that. That's kind of interesting. What and, interests uh, me is I've seen like the Battlestar Galactica game is not werewolf, but it sticks that mechanic in. That's that's where I actually thought he was going at first. With you know, and, and you know, and then they could have done that as Are You a Cylon, but no, they they, they actually made a game. The answer is to that one. I've uh, I have watched that all the way through once, but I wasn't playing. Oh, okay, more recently than uh, Can't Stop Pandemic. That's, um, a, that's a neat game. So, so I had a couple other questions. Far away. Uh, so first of all, on a day-to-day basis, uh, do you find yourself uh, spending more time designing or running the company? Still running the company, but not nearly to as great extent as a few years ago. I'm, uh-huh. I'm getting some good help on that now. Oh, that's great. Now, ideally, I'd spend all my time making games and playing games. I don't know if that'll ever happen. But just give me enough time to come up with an idea once in a while and some people to play the games with, and we'll be good. Uh Uh-huh. Well, it's great when you can get in a a place where where you can get that time. Life, no matter what uh, else is going on, seems to get in the way. We have a good staff right now. We had a great team at PAX. Uh, It's just we really brought the first team. 
Oh, another thing I want to mention, you, you, you mentioned that you played Quadradius. Yes. Oh, so uh, since we, uh, in the can, we have a, a, a Quadradius podcast, which we may get out, and I posted an article on it. I thought our, our How would you play it in a can? It's kind of hard to plug it on. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, it's late. I'll keep making that excuse, guys. It's not getting any earlier here. <laughs> it's a good excuse. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, Quadradius. Uh, I, I just wanted to comment that you had played it. Oh, uh, yes, uh, played it, liked it. Listeners, because uh, I've uh, mentioned it a few times. and uh, So uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, uh, some other games. Uh, uh, Ogre and your early games were very formative for me. I, I, I really enjoyed them. Uh, you're one of, one of the earliest uh, uh, designers that I knew as a designer, as opposed to a monopoly where you have to do a little research to figure out who, who, who actually designed it. Um, and, uh, and so some, uh, I, I, I loved the, the mechanics and uh, the humor in a lot of these things. Uh, and, and some of the ones that stood out for me are uh, uh, the Hacker and uh, Illuminati. I really felt the uh, mechanics there were like you were doing things with cards there that I'd never seen done before. Uh, so I was wondering if you uh, do you have anything to say about the development of those because those seem to come those seem to be very original. You take ideas, you fool around with them. I I wanted to do a game about power structures, and I I pushed cards around the table and drew arrows on them, and things slowly came together. The very first version of Illuminati used cards that were were considerably longer in proportion to their width than regular game cards are and allowed for one control arrow at each end and two on each side. That was a miserable failure. Uh-huh. <laughs> Things got way too complicated. It's as much of anything was a process of physical uh, fumbling to try to find a way to show you know what was what was in my mind was let's use cards to represent conspiratorial groups that might take control of each other and, and show what's going on and in illuminati you have a special type of card that can be the center and uh, later we did the hacker which uses a similar mechanic but everybody is adding on to the net the crime lords game and in, in which any gangster might be the center. And I actually thought that was an improvement because it it simplified things. Uh Uh-huh. But there really is just a lot of physical fumbling with components. Uh, I always start with themes. Sometimes I have ideas for components in my head, just like the shiny 12-sided die was, was part of the idea. But I don't start with a mechanic and look for a theme to fit it. I'm very much the other way. What story I want to tell? I want to tell a story about zombies. What do zombies do? Eat brains. Okay, (laughs) how are we going to represent that? uh, Where do we go with that next? What do zombies... What's bad for zombies? Shotguns. Okay. And in this particular case, even the icons are the same as, as on my original scrawled on copies except the final version is very skillfully executed and my original I had to tell the players what these little thingies meant the uh, Illuminati and uh, and and hacker uh, uh, that 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 uh, design procedure of yours of beginning with a world really shows through because I think that's one of the things that makes it so it makes them so exceptional for me is that the mechanics and the components uh, and the flavor of it all tell this story, and it's, it's tied together in a very visceral way. So for, for uh, uh, listeners who uh, ha- don't know anything about Illuminati, uh, each of the cards represents a, 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 an organization, and, uh, and as you lay out an array, each organization can be in control of other organizations. So you, like, you might have the Boy Scouts being controlled by the NRA. Like uh, the real Illuminati. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and... I, I, uh, that, that's one of the things that moves me most in games is when you can see a system working and the system and the theme are sort of in such harmony. Uh, and they... Thank you, because that's what I try to do. It was based on the Robert Anton Wilson Illuminatus trilogy, right? Inspired by, not oh, based sorry, on. Sorry, um, inspired be- by. Uh, no, the, because the original thought was, was, would it be possible to do something based on that? And 
The answer was no. The answer was no. This is this is too far out. People won't be able to get a handle on it. And at some point I realized that it would be possible to go back to the source material that Wilson and Shea used when they wrote the trilogy and just went which is actual writings of conspirators, lots and lots of actual writings of cons- conspiracy theory nuts, and the Principia Discordia, which is this wonderful public domain epistle of madness. <laughs> it's awesome if you haven't read it. Right. Those were the ingredients in, in their recipe for, for that trilogy, and those are great books, and you should read them. And we said, okay, now we could take these take these same ingredients and Tell a story that's a little bit more accessible. Leave out the giant golden dope smuggling submarines and <laughs> so on and so forth. And all the sex. And just, uh, yes, and all the sex. And, uh, and okay, your, your hostess is snapping her fingers in disappointment here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and tell a story about conspiracies, which is the background of the Illuminatus trilogy, but... but it, but the conspiracies are really only in the background, and, and the foreground is about characters and strange, strange things. I cannot describe the stories any more than I could have really made a game about that. You just have to go read them. You should do yes, that. Yes, if you haven't read the book or the books, um, I'm not sure that being on acid while you read them would actually make them any trippier than just reading them while you're completely uh, sober. At any rate, uh, the the game Illuminati plays out more like silly ravings of somebody who who believes that everything is controlled by everything else, and or everyday daytime radio and TV in the year 2010. Uh, so I have one more thing, which is the proper po- podcast or interview uh, procedure, which is uh, how would someone uh, get these games of yours? Uh, where should they go on the internet? Well, I would prefer that they didn't go on the internet. Oh, okay. I would prefer that you went to your local hobby and game store and support them by giving them money. And if you give them money by buying my games, some of that money will get back to me and I will be happy and your store will be happy and will be there for you next year. Uh, if you have no friendly local game store... I was going to say, or if you're one of our shy and retiring listeners who are afraid to go into those places... If you are a shy and retiring listener who is afraid to go into those places, then suck it up <laughs> and you know just just go out where the scary people are and buy a game. But if you really don't have a game store, then we will sell these things to you online. It's uh, www.sjgames, sjgames.com is our website, and we have a web store, Warehouse 23. But please don't do that first. Your game retailer is there for a reason, and uh, he he gets cool new stuff in there every week, and I want you to go keep your game store alive. That's a great sentiment. All right, yeah, you heard the man. Um, I have one other question before we get our traditional closing, closing. question, um, and that is about uh, Euro games. Um, I'm kind of curious what you think of the Euro game movement and the Euro game style. Well, have you heard about Euro chess? Euro chess? I, I don't. I don't think I have. Well, it looks just like a regular chess board, but you've got a numbered track around the outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not really easy for me to just say, ha ha, here is what Eurogames is and here's what I think about it. Certainly it's not just a track around the edge, even though that does seem to be a dead giveaway. Um, the Euro style has brought some really, really neat, interesting innovations. There are also some mechanics that are typical in Euro games that I really, really don't care for, even when I find them in games that I otherwise like. Uh, uh-huh. And you know, I would I would specifically pick on the the one about you can't tell who's winning because at, at some point you're picking from a stack of chits and and one of them is the you have a whole lot of points chit and now you keep it face down and other people got the ha ha try again chit. 
Uh, do you like that mechanic better when, when uh, there's a lot of them that have the hidden screen, but you know what's going in, you just have to memorize it? No, I really don't like those because I don't like games that put a premium on otherwise pointless memorization. Uh-huh. Uh, if I'm going to play a, a game like that, then, then I'm likely to be a real jerk and say, well, do you mind if I keep notes about everything that, that you put down? And then they go, no, no, you have to remember it. And I say, your game isn't fun. <laughs> well, my yeah, my thing is always... I've played with people where I'm like, well, can I write down what I'm... And they're like, no, you have to memorize it. And I'm like, why? That's right. That's right. Why don't I just go over here and read while you play your game? Yeah. Um, you know, I I would rather interact with people in ways other than just memorizing everything they do. I mean, just if you're going to follow somebody around and memorize everything they do, then you should just be a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> or a personal assistant. Oh, that's a good one. I really try not to get into the Euro games versus Ameritrash debate. Uh, I think nice. it's it's uh, it's rancorous. Uh-huh. There are some really really cool Euros out there. Yay, Puerto Rico! For that matter, Yay, San Juan! That's uh, just a really really elegant adaptation of all the stuff that's going on on the Puerto Rico board. To look, I'm playing some cards. Mm-hmm. Euro game movement. I mean, why do we need a movement? Why don't we just make cool games and learn from each other? Because that would not let people post half the stuff they post on the internet. <laughs> well, I don't have time to read half the stuff they post on the internet. And yeah, in particular, sure. that's the half I don't have time for. Exactly. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, it lets you know what not to read. I, I agree completely. Uh, um, there, uh, it, it is a topic that comes up, and one of the things that I look at in uh, in, in in Euro games, and I love a lot a lot of the European games. I, I like a lot. I think they're mechanics. Uh, there's many mechanics that I'm very interested in, and many many games that I love. Um, but uh, but there are things which I grew up loving in uh, what would be called, I guess, American games because that's all I knew, and uh, I miss some of those. And uh, well, uh, Euro games very often have nothing approximating a die. Dice dice have uses. Uh-huh. It's just don't don't go running around following a banner that makes you abandon things that work. All right, well, before poor Steve falls asleep, considering he is on a different time zone than we are. Too late, though. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to close with our traditional interviewee question, which is pirates or ninjas? Pirates. I had a feeling. Didn't you? (laughs) Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Steve. And uh, to all our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. We will see you in a couple weeks. Good night. Good night. All right. Good night.